drawing over 30 years steeped in the vernacular of modernist and contemporary art history, Julia Cousins refocuses her critical lens on gender disparity in the visual arts. Textile tags, as she calls the collages on exhibition, began as an impulsive lark in the midst of her ongoing studio practice. Much like graffiti artists claiming territory by spray painting over signs, billboards, notices, and posters, Julia deploys a needle, thread, and fabric scraps to tag pages of art publications, art publications featuring male artists. She views her studio practice as a collaboration with anonymous others as she stitches, bundles, sutures, fabrics that have history, use fabrics, discarded, worn, damaged. Receiving her MFA from the University of California, Davis, Julia began working with fiber in the 1990s. She's received the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Fellowship, the Art Matters Foundation Award from New York. Uh, her museum collections include Yale University Art Museum, Weatherspoon Art Museum, University of North Carolina, Greensboro, the Frederick Wiseman Foundation in Los Angeles, Oakland Museum of Art, the University Art Museum in Berkeley, the Achenbach Foundation for Graphic Arts. Um, and she's had exhibitions that have been very important in her career, including the Hammer Museum, uh, UCLA, Orange County Museum of Art, Yale University Art Gallery, and the Nevada Institute for Contemporary Art. A book, let me give you a little preview, accompanies the exhibition. And uh, there will be a book signing in the gallery next Saturday. I realize people can't really see this, but it is an exquisite book um, with essays by Jenny Sorkin and Maria Porges, who will, I believe in May, we have another Zoom session coming up. Jenny Sorkin, who I'm so honored you're joining us, Jenny. It's, it's just, it's great. And it's the first time I'm actually meeting you. So uh, Jenny Sorkin is Associate Professor of History of Art and Architecture at the University of California in Santa Barbara. She writes on the intersections between gender, material culture, and contemporary art, working primarily on woven, oh, I'm sorry, on women artists and underrepresented media. Her publications include Live Form, Women, Ceramics, and Community, Revolution in the Making, Abstract Sculpture by Women Artists, 1947 through 2016, many essays in journals and exhibition catalogs. She was educated at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Bard College, and received her PhD from Yale University. She is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Modern Craft. And this September, there will be a, a recent publication or a new publication, Art in California, written for Thames and Hudson's acclaimed World of Art series. So thank you both. And um, I will turn this over to you now, Jenny. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Patricia, for having me. And thank you, Julia, for uh, making these fabulous works. Uh, I, I have a little PowerPoint here. Um, I just wanted to uh, sort of begin with uh, some of your early works. Uh, you are uh, a staunchly California artist um, and you have uh, great roots in the history of uh, modern art in this state. And I wondered if you could um, talk about uh, your mother who was one of the founding editors of an art magazine called West Art uh, and was very influential to you. Um, I'm just flipping through some uh, early drawing works uh, that I think are very bodily um, and incredibly uh, invested in uh, issues of space and uh, they're kind of photographic. Uh, but could you talk a bit about um, your early history uh, and your mother and the influence of uh, I guess, publications and thinking about art um, in this critical way. Uh, 
Right. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Pat, and thank you, Jenny, and all who are here. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, well, my uh, I was born and raised in Auburn, California. Um, it, I, you know, that it, my family home has. I was in the family home all my life, or the. Uh, I never moved a bedroom and very stable. Uh, my mother was a, um, she was the founding editor of West Art um, and not the founding publisher, but the founding editor. <clears throat> and uh, her background was not in art. She was a, a, a librarian and a, and a writer, wrote children's stories and uh, was a very was a very interesting sort of um, background to the extent that we were living up in this little town of Auburn and uh, back in 1961 there was nothing um, about contemporary art writing uh, anything and the publisher was an artist who had come out a newspaper man who had uh, trained as an artist in uh, Minneapolis uh, and so he you know saw the lack saw the need and started the publication. Uh, my mother was a <clears throat> sort of very uh, prep school uh, grammarian and uh, artists would come to the house up on their motorcycles and I mean she would feed them little sandwiches and um, it was all kind of very weird but they needed her uh, for her ability to shape their language, shape their writing, help them to um, to get the word out. And uh, so her that was her background, not as a not as an appreciator of contemporary art, but as a an appreciator of of grammar, language, clarity, words, uh, being clear. And um, but because these these people, these uh, powerful people, they were clearly very different from the ranchers and farmers that I knew. And, uh, hugely instrumental, and in, uh, they affected me. And I, I avoided. I was, uh, you know, skilled uh, uh, from the get in in making art and drawing and painting, and I was encouraged in that. But once these people started coming to the house. I realized that there was more to art in terms of, you know, who you were as a person and, and uh, the sort of energy that artists project. And I, and I was, uh, I didn't, I majored in English and philosophy in undergrad because I just really sort of intuitively understood I wasn't quite ready to get in that in that world and so then went to art school after um after undergraduate school and but i uh my mother was um was hugely influential to the extent that she she mentored me in writing um and i would have to say she mentored me in joy so that's that's a lovely tribute to her uh what's i went back to the <clears throat> page of um Stitch and Bitch, your current show at Patricia Sweeto Gallery. Um, because what's so interesting is that Art Forum magazine, which is really the, the source of the critique in these textile tags, is established the year after uh, your mother found uh, West Art in 1962 uh, here in California in San Francisco. Um, moves to LA a few years after and by 67 has picked up and moved to New York where they are permanently uh, are located but it was never um, a female friendly uh, publication um, from from its get-go or from its roots um, but I do want to just sort of go through a couple early images so that our audience here gets a sense of um, the wide berth or range of your production um, you your kind of breakout work were these drawings um, after graduate school at Davis. Uh, you finished in 1990, um, and there is a kind of uh, investment in thinking about language, particularly through titles. Um, this is a title in Latin, uh, which you translated for me because I am not a Latin kind of person, uh, which means breathing space. Um, 
is there anything you want to say about these early works? Because you did say you have this, uh, you know, sort of, this was maybe your first medium, drawing, painting, uh, and works on paper. Right, drawing uh, is sort of the foundation of, I mean, it was my first, uh, first contact with art, I mean, chalk in the hand, um, and I've you know, continued to, um, to directly uh, work with my hand, and um, uh, these, uh, these works, you know, I'd been, I'd been working in painting and various things, but there was something about the, for me, truly, it, it's my hand to the thing, because the paintbrush somehow seemed to sort of like separate me uh, from the work and I would it would put me back in my head which is a place I endeavor to stay out of to the extent possible and so these these charcoal drawings are just rubbing ground charcoal with a rag or paper towel and um, you know very clearly they they directly relate to the body which is how I my first response to work is generally um, a visceral one, um, something that is felt that I respond to um, its physicality. Uh, and so this, um, and it was kind of like developing a language for the body, not thinking in terms of gender specifically. I was not interested in, in male, female, but more, a more, um, um, uh, something prior to gender you know, before there starts to be division, there is first the cell, there is the, the egg, the, that first letter, the A to the language of humanity, um, which was, which is where I continue to sort of like operate from and partly why, you know, this whole project now has evolved from this, this idea of, you know, there is something more fundamental than he, she, you know, old, young, <laughs> black, binary. white. Yes, yeah. the binary situation. Right. Um, binary situation. So, so aborigine means from the first, and so the first, I'm thinking about, you know, that first cell, that first moment, and just, you know, getting my measure of it. Um, and the, uh, I think that this kind of uh, bodily response uh, is is actually a mark of uh, a kind of feminine or early feminist thinking. Uh, it's a lot of women make sort of bodily responsive work um, or think about uh, the physicality of their practice um, in relationship to scale their own bodies um, and uh, you know, grow the practice uh, as you did in this particular piece, which is um, a series of uh, drawings uh, in a grid-like formation um, that becomes installation or even uh, almost sculptural on the wall. Yeah, this is an installation in Christopher Grimes' gallery back in the 90s, and Abintra is from within, and Abintra galore, meaning from, you know, in in the gloriousness of it, I wanted it to sort of duplicate like a, a movie screen that you could enter into, you know, bodily enter into this coalescing, um, unfolding, um, roiling mass of, of energy, um, thingness, um, you know, uh, so. Yeah, and you did produce sculpture, uh, which I'm really taken with. Uh, are these early pieces, uh, uh, glossolalia, uh, which is uh, the phenomenon of speaking in tongues, uh, and these kind of uh, lingua franca, these kind of um, cast pieces. Uh, I'm not sure if they're wax or if they're. Could you talk a little bit about the the okay. physicality of these works, but Clearly there's um, something uh, delightfully abject um, and related to language once again, and uh, the kind of rootedness in uh, not finding words or being tongue tied or not, you know, having a, a mother tongue, all of these kinds of uh, lingual, prelingual states of um, the psyche, we might say. Well, uh, right. 
exactly. Uh, I it, it, there there is a lot of sculpture, not you know more than tongues, but you know sort of all dealing with this the uh, uh, with the body. I had kind of come to the end of the intense refinement of the drawings. I you know understood uh, what they were, what the terrain was, where I was going, and less uh and and as i understood too i was becoming increasingly interested in liquidity as i was trying to convey the quality of light or the quality of moisture the yokiness the egginess of of cellular configurations or of of life i really you know how do i translate that into something physical and i um, started working with Sculpey, which is a low fired ceramic, and you know, so thinking about okay, the body, well, what's you know, what what is the first thing, you know, what what kind of wet thing? Well, tongue, you know, my tongue. So, so I uh, was told about Sculpey, which is a low fire ceramic. So, I made a one tongue and then two tongues and three tongues and uh four tongues and um so fire the the um it's a low fire ceramic and then i glaze them with um a sort of a hot uh adhesive ethyl vinyl acetate which is like a hot glue that just that i could spew over I painted them and then you know drizzled the the glue over them to give them that that yoki that wet um tongueness and um yeah, I mean, it's one thing leads to another, which is, you know, pretty much how my practice goes, goes with, you know, things blow up. And get bigger, uh, which it get seems bigger. is the uh, same uh, situation we might say with textile tags, uh, which also has a, a kind of resonant relationship to language, once again. So, uh, you know, there's a, a deep um, appreciation for and blotting out of language, in this case, uh, men's names uh, in favor of women's names, uh, in favor of um, uh, pointing out the absurdities or the difficulties of uh, women being excluded from uh, art gallery advertisements um, and therefore excluded from the art world, art galleries, commercial uh, representation, and then museum collection and all of that. But before we get into those issues, could you talk a bit about uh, language um, in these advertisements and sort of your use of um, covering over or adding? Well, I mean, uh, you know, it, it just, it, it, I always have work on the side that I use to kind of keep, keep the pilot light on in the studio, which is what this was. I mean, you know, I have the, the other sort of, the other work, which has, which is a little more sort of Subterranean, and this began with a, you know, just a recognition of uh, being tired of, you know, same old sort of, you know, as I'm flipping through, seeing, you know, uh, the amount of money and attention and focus. So I stitched instead of spraying, and. Um, you know, again, one thing leads to another. And um, at first I just, at first I started just using scraps from my other work, um, you know, cutting it up or cannibalizing it and s tacking it on uh, just to, you know, the most, the first and most direct. And then, uh, but you know, it was uh, amusing, um, it, diverting. And as I began to sort of become more thoughtful in, in um, looking at what it was that I was um, tagging, um, then I began to address the image sometimes in a sort of collaboration as a call and response to it, um, not just necessarily an obliteration. To be clear, this project isn't just necessarily about um, you know, women, uh, I mean, that's the, that's the starting point, but it's really also about all of us who can get marginalized by virtue of our gender, sexuality, race, age, and it is a continuing issue. 
Um, and certainly there are, uh, there are artists that are represented in this, in this work that I um, admire, uh, but um, I think that this project just sort of like begged to be done. And this is, you know, uh, stitching over all of the, here's a group show and here we go. We've got, you know, a list of uh, artists and I just stitched over all the men and left the three. Um, sculpture seems to be better represented by, you know, it's 50-50 here, women to men. Um, but the paintings we have, one woman to, I don't know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten men, the odds aren't very good. Um, and the next slide is a, um, uh, this is a, a gallery that is representing no women. As you can see, there are no women um, that have the, the privilege or the opportunity to be represented by this distinguished um, gallerist. Male gallerist, we might say. Uh, and, and yes, as, I might, as we might say, right. Uh, this is, um, now this is a, uh, so, you know, I accumulate a lot of materials in the studio I, from various sources and I have bins and bins and um, I rifle through uh, and this is a piece of found um, crochet or, or tatting. I don't personally know how to crochet or knit. Um, all I know how to do is stitch, but this, just this little, piece of a, it was like a, I don't know whether it was a doily or it might have been intended as a collar, but I, you know, and in, in, so in stacking up a lot of these um, images and then finding the, you know, the, it's that agreeable encounter with what's on hand, I realized, oh, well, this makes the perfect collar uh, like uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I'm wearing this collar today that I made in honor of her, uh, because as we all know, she was the first Jewish woman on the Supreme Court. She was the second woman ever on the Supreme Court, and um, she was uh, fought for gender equality and women's rights, and wore collars in her uh, famous She was also um, a love Fashion and so on. Um, I think that you know often uh, women's clothing wear can be discussed as like dismissing them. And she brought that to the to the fore by enhancing what she wore. Um, it was it was like a feminine gauntlet. I mean, a gauntlet is a I think it's a glove, a met, metal glove, but her gauntlet were these beautiful collars, lace, uh, nothing is as feminine as lace, and, uh, and she, you know, made it her um, signature, and it's yeah. quite beautiful. Thank you for um, going through this image with us. Uh, I want to go back to uh, just a kind of idea here. You mentioned age as one of the discriminatory factors for artists, and uh, even this last artist, Beverly Pepper, uh, who only recently uh, got some uh, attention, uh, but was a major uh, sculptor living abroad in Italy for most of her career, not really participating in the American scene anymore, but uh, doing a lot of welding and large scale um, steel metal sculptures, uh, sometimes with iron. Um, but uh, there's this kind of idea um, that uh, it's a kind of tongue in cheek idea that the Guerrilla Girls put out there uh, in their poster um, from the early 80s about um, uh, how to be a successful woman artist. And it was largely about obscurity and disappearance. But they have one about, uh, you know, waiting until you're 80 to reach any kind of, um, I can't think of the exact phrasing, but it's it's about not being uh, recognized, having to wait until you're 80 to get a career retrospective or to get any kind of attention in the art world. Um, and it seems that that has actually been one of the threshold ages, um, unfortunately, that it wasn't really so tongue in cheek. Uh, Judy Chicago uh, is having a major retrospective um, this coming year. She's over 80. Uh, Alice Neal, uh, 
did not live to see either of her big retrospectives happen, uh, but certainly not this one that's at the Met that's gotten um, a kind of roaring celebration. Uh, she died in 84. Um, but uh, what do you think about this problem of being a late career artist uh, and uh, having, I guess, to, I guess, compete or scrounge or work hard um, for attention um, as a woman, as a late career woman artist? What does all this mean? <laughs> well, I'm not 80 yet, so. No, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> um. And if 80 is the threshold, I guess then hope springs eternal. Um, but, uh, you know, I always have to work hard. I mean, you know, it's always hard. It's, um, and um, I don't suppose that I can really afford to, for me, just for me, I can't afford to stay in, um, in a place of, um, in resentment or or anger um i just um i need to keep myself um teachable and um open and sort of like embodied in the moment um it's gr it's been grossly unfair we know that i mean no doubt people in this room in this meeting know that but you know, to the larger world, it's still an issue. Um, and you know, I mean, as an older artist too, I I, I think that there are, uh, you know, I mean, people sort of may think that I never had, um, uh, I don't know, what this, you know, that I that I've always come with this face. I've always come. I am. I've always been this face, this body um where really what we're doing should be without this baggage that we carry that it's an inside job and um you know it's how fierce is your spirit um you know in my way i hope that this uh this project brings you know continues to call attention to to the issue and that it's still and you know to understand it for what it is which is about you know the whole idea of patriarchy uh and what that means for not just women but but you know all of all of those who get excluded and you know separated out I think that that's a, you've, you've offered a lot of really nice advice for younger artists who I think are really grappling with um, how to live, how to make work, uh, what to do post pandemic, uh, how to gain visibility. Um, but I think one of the, the things that you said about not being, um, not giving into resentment and bitterness and having a kind of fierceness of spirit um, are, are really moving. Uh, it's a kind of moving idea to, uh, you know, stay teachable, as you just put it, um, or uh, keep learning or, um, not fall prey to the kind of uh, bitterness or feeling of anger or resentment that um, does linger often um, in, in terms of the, the unique and unjust unfairness um, that is the art world. Uh, it is a place of um, intense hierarchy, uh, you know, in, intense um, economic differences. Uh, it's also, I think, uniquely hard to be um, a West Coast artist um, living uh, in the North versus the South. I know you keep a studio in Los Angeles, um, but you know, San Francisco was a center at the beginning of the 20th century. I don't know um, now that we're 20 years into the 21st century, if San Francisco will come back as a center. Uh, it is not the center of um, California's art world, Los Angeles is. But you know, you this is your home, and this is um, a place that you come from and are attached to. So, I you know, I don't think of California as regional, but I think that regional is actually an interesting designation in terms of thinking about does regional actually mean community? Does it help us if we use that term or disavow that term? Um, I'm just kind of riffing here off off of uh, some of your really great ideas. Well, I mean, and actually, I literally live on an island up in the Sacramento River Delta. I live just, uh, I live on Merritt Island outside Clarksburg, which is needless to say, uh, in the in the studio visit gulag, 
Which you could say then means that I've had to work harder um, to, uh, to engage and, to, and I've had to come to, uh, to LA and to certainly Instagram has been hugely um, beneficial. It's you know, kind of an open studio visit uh, and you know, having to, to do all that, but you know, and maybe, you know, I don't know about regional. I don't, um, I don't feel connected necessarily to, to my, to the, you know, I, I just, I don't, I try not to put myself into a, into a bracket of I'm a this kind of artist or that kind of artist. I mean, yes, absolutely. I'm a California artist. I was born and raised here. I am not leaving here. Probably not leaving Mer Mer uh, Merritt Island until I go out in a pine box, but you know, we'll see. Um, and yeah, regionalism, maybe it is a good thing. Maybe it is that local, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm riffing here too. Well, how does it feel then? I think that this is one of the things that um, young artists in particular grapple with, uh, or any artists, but you've made your peace with it in some way of having this split practice in terms of having a place where you live most of the time that you, that is a retreat, that is rural, that uh, you raise chickens, uh, mm -hmm. another sort of um, investment in the egg, we might say, uh, or the yokiness. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, materiality, but, uh, you know, then having a, a studio in Los Angeles that you haven't been able to use all, you know, in a year because of the pandemic, uh, but having that kind of split life where, you know, it's uniquely hard to live and work in an urban environment um, and, you know, do work while you're supposed to be running around seeing shows. I think it's a kind of split life problem. Um, and, you know, I'm guessing your best thinking comes on Merritt Island, maybe with your chickens. Yeah, I mean, you know, every place has its challenge. And I mean, I'll say to the extent that I'm uh, isolated out on Merritt Island, I'm not having to worry about, oh, my God, I haven't seen that show yet and getting in the car and jumping and, you know, going to it, this, you know, the, 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 I don't have the distractions of an urban um, environment. And that's, very good and um you know i but uh so i mean i think we all you know we it's we just all need to find our daily our our daily rhythm our daily prayer our daily touch um you know i i will say that those charcoal drawings started i was in an accident and um uh, and I saw which required surgery and recovery and I was in a uh, uh, and I couldn't get access to my studio and do big paintings and so I started working off my lap and my lap was my I had a laptop literally a laptop studio and started with a little you know four by five uh. charcoal and grew it from there and I think that's what you know that's what we all need to do is we start from here we start from the you know day one every day is is day day one not to be you know all such a you know pollyanna but well it's I'm, not being a pollyanna i think that there's a i mean there's a relationship even to uh frida kahlo was a lap artist for most of her career she made small uh you know exquisite uh paintings um you know, on her back, uh, she she also was in an accident, um, a really detrimental one that left her, um, you know, disabled um, and in a lot of pain most of her life. But you know, the scale of work um, has a direct relationship to her body, and you're saying that the scale of work here had a, re a direct relationship to your body. Um, and then you know, you grew that scale through uh, sculptural pieces. Um, you've also done large scale, I don't have an image of it, but large scale textile works that um, uh, are also sculptural simultaneous to this body of work that we're looking at, the textile tags, which maybe seemed at the time, you know, a, a kind of way of working uh, through ideas, but in fact becomes a primary body of work. Um, how does it feel to do sort of accidental work that becomes primary? Oh, you know, I love it because, um, in a weird way, it, it, I love not having to sort of think. Um, I mean, this this 
you know, I sort of under in a weird way, it's like individually every piece is fresh, every piece is new, but I also, it did have a certain parameter. It's like, okay, what can I do with this piece? Um, you know, I have this much to work with. These are my materials. What can I do? Just as, you know, with the, with the charcoal on paper, I had charcoal and paper. What can I do? Um, and so I'd like to talk about this piece. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, and so, um, so the, so when you find, when you have a limitation, you can go deep. You don't, when you're not having to worry about, you know, the whole arena, the, the entire stage, and you can just focus on, you know, one component, then that is an opportunity to dig in deeper. This piece, um, the, the advertisement is, a uh, it, it's a reproduction of a painting in that, uh, that is a portrait of William Penn, who uh, is a, uh, he was actually very interesting. He was an English um, religious thinker and he was a Quaker. He was imprisoned in the Tower of London um, for writing a, a treatise called No Cross, No Crown. He was against, uh, he was absolutely for religious freedom and um, came to the States. He was, um, he uh, founded, Philadelphia or, or he, as a as a colonist he was relatively decent he was I mean if Wikipedia is to be believed uh, a good guy he made uh, he had successful relations with the Lenny Lenape, Lenny Lenapia indigenous people made a a successful treaty with them uh, and he uh, sort of mapped out Philadelphia and, um, and named the streets with, with trees, which is why it's called Pennsylvania, which means Penn's Woods. And he inspired the original premise of the Constitution, which was personal freedom, religious freedom, um, and democracy. Unfortunately, that got co-opted. His sons eventually, you know, legislated out Quakers and Catholics and we all know how it all falls apart. And this, this textile is a found scrap of Williamsburg, uh, uh, a piece of tourist, tr uh, someone's tea towel that was cross-stitched the capital of Williamsburg, which is colonial Williamsburg, which was, you know, the site of the American political events that led to the American Revolution. And I then, so I just layered that over the image and then embroidered in the, uh, the flames as a metaphor for oh, sorry. You know, where we are. Uh, which is lovely. I can't actually see any of the questions, but I know we're getting some. So I'm going to stop my share for a moment um, with the images, but I'll just show the rest of the ones I have. Uh, this is one from Gagosian that has mother emblazoned at the top. Uh, this is textile tag 164. Where are you up to in terms of your textile tags? How many do you have total right now? 182, I think, but I lose track and I, I, I don't, I, um, about, uh, oh, on just under a 200. This is self-explanatory. This is a very funny one. Um, dark, darkly funny, we might say. <laughs> um, uh, here's another one. Uh, Mark de Suvro piece that has a, a sort of uh, you're riffing off the lines of his own uh, works. Uh, there's also yeah, kind of insider sure. quality because you have to know that that's Mark de Suvro. Uh, so it, it, his name is mostly covered up. Uh, here's a Richard Serra piece. Um, All right, we can go back to these. Um, I'm gonna stop share so that I can actually see some of the questions. Um, how do you source the fabrics that you use? Do their origins contribute to the content of the works? Uh, I um, am a thrift shop. Um, I go to thrift shops. I go to the, the Goodwill bins, which is a, <clears throat> Sort of the end of the line of goodwill stores before everything is shipped overseas to be um, made into compost so it's by the pound um, and um, you know found found materials i also um you know 
have fabrics scraps and, and um, use fabric stores and uh, but mostly it's just what I've collected from thrifting and um, and and scavenging um, <clears throat> You know, I'm I'm conscious of using um, the craft work of of anonymous. I don't know who made the work, um, and so um, you know, it's a collaboration with an unknown maker. Um, and you know, probably I'm violating some of the political beliefs of some of those makers, but you know, that's how it is. That's you know where we go. Um, it's also a form of honoring, though, their labor, I think. That there's, uh, there's a kind of relationship in which you are, you know, an avowed amateur textile uh, maker, uh, you know, with a, with a sort of um, basic stitching uh, that you're, you know, basic running stitch that you're using in your, in your creations. Um, and you're using the, at sometimes highly skilled labor of other people uh, who may or may not be women, but we can assume that they might be, so that you have this kind of vernacular collaborator um, or silent um, practitioner who uh, also falls into that category of um, uh, love hours that Mike Kelly so eloquently um, put forward, uh, I think in the, right around the time in the early 90s, uh, this idea of, um, all those sock puppets that were given away that women crocheted and were, were tossed off to the thrift stores. There's something uh, very um, relational to that uh, sort of statement that these are other people's love hours and you are acknowledging their work and using their work in a sense to tag um, uh, advertisements that are, are um, not uh, forward thinking in certain ways. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm very, I, I very much began to recognize as I'm going through some of these amazing uh, pieces of, of embroidery and knitting and, and crocheting that are just, that are stunning that I don't know how to do and retrieving them from anonymity and being able to give them a new life. Um, and um, certainly their craft skills, whoever, um, in some ways are far greater than mine. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I love ours is, that's, uh, that's quite good. That's quite good. Uh, somebody has a question, Carrie uh, Burkle. Was the slow process of stitching cathartic in a way to work through the dismissiveness of the art world of being a woman artist? Did it bring you peace or comfort? Oh, I, you know, I never have peace and I never have comfort. So, um, it's, you know, I, I wish. Um, no, um, you know, I, I generally have to find ways to, um, to keep going without having to, you know, it's, I'm, I try to stay, again, stay out of my head. And so um, when nothing else can, um, to keep from sort of grinding on my, um, uh, on the nugget that I'm grinding on, whatever, you know, my interior self, then stitching is just, it's a, it's a, it's just a, it's like a machine. It's a mechanism. It's a, it's a kind of mindlessness that keeps, and it just helps me generate stuff. The more stuff I have, then the more luxurious I can be with it. The more I can just, you know, cut it up and rework it. And I don't have to feel um, precious about it because that's, you know, uh, that can be deadly, but I, I, no, it does not. I, there is no peace. I think that's a useful omission or admission rather, uh, an admission about omission. Um, I, in my essay for your textile tags, uh, book, uh, I did reference and talk about, um, this work as a form of femage, which is the Miriam Shapiro, um, invented term, uh, feminist um, or feminine collage um, in which uh, she posited uh, in the late 70s the idea that women actually were the inventors of collage, not just the cubists like Picasso and Brock, but that 
women through scrapping uh, Victorian album making, um, drying flowers, all of the kind of nostalgic practices of um, saving note cards and making valentines um, and drying lavender, that all of that was a form of collage practice that um, went unattributed uh, because it simply was dismissed as feminine um, or as um, uniquely nostalgic or sentimental, too sentimental or too precious. So I'm wondering what do you, um, somebody here asked about sourcing the textiles. How do you choose fabrics and materials? What qualities are you looking for? Um, I assume you are interested in the, that kind of preciousness in which you can see really highly skilled work um, that you're looking for when you go through fabric bundles or, you know, are you just getting stuff all at once and then you go through it later at home? No, I pick and choose. I mean, I, um, you know, often I, if it's, if it's just found in a bin on, in a, in a pile, I just sort of pull through and if something catches my eye, whether it's the sheen of the material, whether it's a, a lacy thing, um, or, you know, it becomes a scrap of, of crochet, I'll pull it out. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's this amazing thing. Sometimes they're quite, I think they're quite ugly. It's not like necessarily to my taste, whatever, you know, that may be, but, but I also understand that taste is a very, you know, to the, I try to work against my own taste because that can be, that can sort of become a little too sort of civilized and um, that there, there is something in the, um, in this, you know, the piece that I can use like grit to work against, or it can help cut my, um, cut what's maybe my mannerism or my, you know, so, to, so that I can continue to stay open to, to keep, you know, I'm much more interested in work that continues to circulate. So it's neither this nor that, and it hovers in legibility and it hovers in tone. And so these alien forms, these alien textiles and fabrics that are maybe something I personally would not, you know, have on my bed, um, are absolutely imperative to be used in the work. I don't know if that helps to, to answer that question, but, um, and it's a good question. Um, do we have any other questions about this? There's a, a couple, um, I think those are the, the main questions that have been brought up as a uh, sort of process. Um, I, I'm curious about taste. When you say uh, things not to your taste or working against your own taste, do you think that that taste um, is formed through, uh, I don't know, do you think art school has, has being a trained artist has, um, I don't know, put forward biases that you actively now work, work against? Well, you know, that's a big question. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, taste can mean, t I guess, I'm, is sort of a foregone conclusion. Um, you know, this is what, this is what the, the work should be, this is what we understand as being legitimate, this is what we understand as being recognizable as painting, as viable painting, as viable sculpture. Um, and um, part of the practice is to continually kind of question that. I mean, I, I know I'm in an interesting place when I start to become afraid of my work a little bit. It's like, oh no, you know, oh God, not that. I mean, <laughs> please not that. I don't, I don't mean it to be that. It can't be that. I'm not that sort of person. And then, but then I know then I'm on a, then I'm touched on something that's threatening to me that is very real that is um that you know well you know gee i mean julia yeah maybe that is a part of you maybe you do have that corny um sentimentality or you have that lyrical um 
thread or whatever, you know, and it's, um, and that's where these issues, you know, arrive. And, um, and that's, you know, so the, so the job becomes, you know, paying attention to the, paying attention to that. And, and those voices that are saying, oh, you know, no, no, we, you know, it needs to be shaped up. It needs to be um, made to look like, uh, you know, that, that sort of um, censorship, censorship of taste, perhaps. I don't know if that's clear. That's a, that, that makes a lot of sense. It's a big issue. Uh, but it's an interesting one because you're also using a lot of um, vernacular textiles that you're finding in, in, you know, in these places that you wouldn't um, like the colonial Williamsburg tea towel, which I think is a, you know, a, a perfect example, uh, which is, you know, even strange to think that it's made its way this far west. Uh, right. It was clearly somebody's vacation. Right. Um, weekend in old ye old colonial yes shops of williamsburg yes uh we have one more question here uh from karina uh kranzola uh sorry if i'm saying your name wrong um trends in artistic production are always out there how influenced are you by these trends does instagram and other social media contribute to these trends and two, is it important to you that your work has a political purpose? Uh, well, you know, I can't claim to be um, naive or primitive and I'm, um, you know, I'm always looking and I'm not, and, and so I'm, you, you, you know, I mean, I'm aware of, of what's going on um, in the contemporary world. It interests me. Um, I'm always looking, I'm always curious. Um, but I don't, um, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the conversation that I have with myself in the studio. I mean, that's, um, no, I mean, um, uh, no, uh, <clears throat> I'm just sort of concerned with m what's my truth. Um, and there was another part to the question. Uh, trends in artistic production are always out there. How influenced are you by these trends? And does Instagram and other social media contribute to these trends? <clears throat> no, I, you know, well, I don't know whether it does or doesn't. It's, it doesn't. Um, it's not something that I think about. I don't. And, and um, you know, I'm sort of a, a worker among workers, so it's not for me to sort of like uh, shape a trend or think about a trend. Um, and Instagram uh, is, is a gateway. Um, it's like a global studio visit. I mean, it's truly democratic, which is um, quite wonderful. Um, and, y y you know, I suppose it's, it's, you know, up to the person to use it as they will. Um, and, you know, I have found, um, through Instagram, um, people, uh, artists of like sort of, um, spirit, you know, in, I don't know, Iceland or wherever that I wouldn't normally have the opportunity to, to know of. And that I view as a, is a, it's a good thing. I'm also aware that it's highly curated. And so of course, everyone is seeing the, the Instagram feeds and, you know, you can start to think that everyone is massively productive 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. And I have to, you know, stay in my own lane and not worry, go down that rabbit hole, you know, that, Oh my God, I'm, you know, which I think is a, it's a legitimate fear of, uh, you know, the curated social uh, media. Um, right. I'm going to ask you one last question from the audience, uh, Sadie Bills. I'm curious about the dialogue you are creating between the textiles and the ad images. It seems there is a call and response happening. The glossy images inform the textiles, and the textiles inform the the glossy images inform the textiles, and the textiles inform the images. Do you feel that you are having an, having dialogues with individual artists? Can you speak more to that process? 
Yes, that's a great question. And yes, I mean, I absolutely have had encounters with other artists in this work that um, that has been a, a dialogue. Um, absolutely. Um, which has, you know, given me um, another, they've helped me sort of open my own language. Um, I also had a very sort of strange encounter the last time I was in LA was for the um, Freeze Art Fair before COVID blew up. And I was in the, it was in the art fair going around and I saw this work, which I, it was a sculpture which stunned me because I, I, I recognized it as I know that work because I had, I had just um, embroidered over that very work it had been pictured in an ad it was a sculpture, and now I can't recall the name of the artist, but it's a minimalist sculpture of a, of a wheel in a field of, of uh, field flowers. And I had just been working with that. And then to see the actual work in the, in the gallery was quite, uh, it was like I had this um, personal connection to it. It was like a secret, we, uh, you know, I'd had a secret affair with that piece. And it was, quite a kick in the head. I think that's a really good place to end, uh, the kick in the head, uh, and also the intimacy of uh, looking at works in person, which I think we're all maybe looking really forward to doing again. Uh, some people are maybe out there doing it now, uh, and I envy them. Um, but uh, Patricia, do you want to just uh, sort of wrap us up and tell us what the um, hours of the gallery are, how to make an appointment, and when the show, um, what the next highlights are with textile tags? Oh, Jenny, I'm, I'm actually so sorry that the conversation is ending. This has been so interesting. So thank you. And thank you, Julia. Um, a really, really good fascinating and informative talk so okay to your um, so the gallery is open Wednesday through Saturday 11 to 5 ish I would really recommend calling the gallery and or emailing uh, for an appointment there's also a booking app on my website so you can book your appointment. If you do so and you can't make it, please um, consider canceling the appointment. And in terms of upcoming events, we have uh, next Saturday, Julia will be in the gallery uh, for book signing. As I said, once again, textile tabs so you can pick up your copy at that time. Um, Julia, what, what time will you be here? Do you recall the time? It's on the website, so it's under current exhibition. You can just go there and check for the time. Um, feel free to come. Even if you don't make an appointment, it'll be just fine. Um, and then, the exhibition ends May 22nd. I would recommend you don't wait that long. However, we will have another Zoom session with uh, Maria Porges, which is also on the website. But this has just been phenomenal. Jenny, you're fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Julia, what can I say? Love you dearly. Um, Julia's doing a really nice flip, a slow flip down there in the, in the lower corner yeah, of, of yes, the book. Yes. Julia is, uh, is giving you a preview. Um, it's a really, really f wonderful book. So uh, don't miss your copy. And I will mail it to you. So that is not a problem. Mm -hmm. Just send me an email. And you I, want to, yeah. I would just like to end for me, if I may read the acknowledgement. Yes, of course. And that will be all I'll say, otherwise, I hope for those who can to come and see the show. It really is quite exuberant and um, as a critique, it's a, it's a pretty exuberant and ebullient um, array of work. And I've acknowledged all of you in the book to say to all the artists, colleagues and peers, goads, mentors, studio assistants, friends and inspirations, past and present, 
who have doggedly worked, often unsung and unsought, in the crevices and cold shadows of the art world's patriarchal 1%, you are fierce. And you are the reason. Thank you. I think that's a lovely way to, to wrap. Uh, thank you, Julia, for this uh, phenomenal work um, and those words. <laughs>